Konnichiwa. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those who have joined us on site and online. Welcome to our workshop, Data Protection for the Next Generation, Putting Children First. Before we begin the session, I would like to encourage both on-site and remote participants to kindly scan the Mentimeter QR code, which will be available on the screen shortly, or use the link in the chat box to express your expectations from the session. As a reminder, I would like to request all the speakers and the audience who may ask questions during the Q&A round to please speak clearly and at a reasonable pace. I would also like to request everyone participating to maintain a respectful and inclusive environment in the room and in the chat. For those who wish to ask questions during their Q&A round, please raise your hand. Once I call upon you, you may use the standing microphones available in the room. And while you do that, please state your name and the country you are from before asking your question. Additionally, please make sure that you mute all the other devices when you are speaking so as to avoid any audio disruptions. If you are participating online and have any questions or comments and would like the moderator to read out your question or comment, please type it in the Zoom chat box. When posting, please start and end your sentence with a question mark to indicate that it is a question or use a full stop to clearly indicate that it is a comment. Thank you. Let us now begin the session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for joining today's session. I am Ananya. I am the Youth Advisor to the USAID Digital Youth Council, and I will be the on-site moderator for today's session. Mariam from Gambia will be the online moderator, and Nelly from Georgia will be the rapporteur for this session. Today, we embark on a journey that transcends the boundaries of traditional discourse and delves into the intricate realm of safeguarding children's digital lives. In this age of boundless technological advancements, we find ourselves standing at a pivotal juncture where the collection and utilization of children's data have reached unprecedented heights. From the moment their existence becomes evident, their digital footprints begin to form shaping their online identities even before they can comprehend the implications. Ultrasound images, baby cameras, social media accounts, search engine inquiries, the vast web of interconnected platforms weaves a tapestry of data silently capturing every heartbeat, every interaction. But amidst this digital tapestry lies a profound challenge, the protection of children's data and their right to privacy. Children, due to their tender age and limited understanding, may not fully grasp the potential risks, consequences, and safeguards associated with the processing of their personal information. They are often left vulnerable, caught in the crossfire between their innocent exploration of the online world and the complex web of data collecting institutions. Hence, today, we are gathered here to delve deeper into the discourse on children's online safety, moving beyond the usual topics of cyberbullying and internet addiction. Our focus will be on answering the following questions. How do we uh, ensure that children in different age groups understand, value, and negotiate their digital self and privacy online? What capabilities or vulnerabilities affect their understanding of their digital data and digital rights? What is a good veg age verification mechanism so that such mechanism does not in itself end up collecting even more personal data? And finally, how can we involve children as active partners in the development of data governance policies and integrate their evolving capabilities, real life experiences, and perceptions of the digital world to ensure greater intergenerational justice in laws, policies, strategies, and programs? We hope that this workshop will help the attendees unlearn the current trend of universal and often adult treatment of all users, which fails to respect children's evolving capacity, often lumping them into overly broad categories. Attendees will be introduced to the ongoing debates on the digital age of consent. Panelists will also elaborate on children's perception of their data self and the many types of children's privacy online. Participants will also be given a flavor of the varying national and international conventions concerning the rights of children regarding their data. As our speakers 
come from a range of stakeholder groups. They will provide the attendees with a detailed idea on how a multi-stakeholder, intergenerational, child-centered, child rights-based approach to data governance-related policies and regulations can be created. I invite you all to actively engage in the session to listen to our esteemed panelists and to ask questions, contribute your insights, and share perspectives. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today. To begin with, we have Professor Sonia Livingstone, who is a professor at the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics. She has published about 20 books and advised the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, OECD, ITU, and UNICEF on children's safety, privacy, and rights in the digital environment. Next, we have Edmund Chung, who serves as the CEO of Dot Asia on the board of ICANN, Make a Difference, Engage Media, Exco of ISOC Hong Kong, and Secretariat of APRIGF. He has co-founded the Hong Kong Kids International Film Festival and participates extensively on internet governance matters. Next, we have Njimile Davis-Michael, who is a senior program analyst in the technology division of USAID, where she helps to drive the agency's development efforts related to internet affordability, data governance, and protecting children and youth from digital harms. Next, we have Emma Day, who is a human rights lawyer specializing in human rights and technology, and she is also the co-founder of Tech Legality. She has been working on human rights issues for more than 20 years now and has lived for five years in Africa and six years in Asia. And last but not the least, we have Feodor Askedes, who is a technology policy expert. She consults with civil society organizations, including, but not limited to, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, National Democratic Institute, Committee to Protect Journalists, and Partnerships on AI. I would now like to move to the next segment, I now invite our speakers to take the floor and convey their opening remarks to our audience. I now invite Professor Sonia Livingstone to please take the floor. Thank you um, very much for that um, introduction and it's, uh, it's wonderful to be um, part of this uh, panel. Um, so I want to talk about children's right to privacy in, in the uh, digital environment and as with other uh, colleagues here I'll take a child rights um, focus recognizing holistically the full range of children's rights in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and then homing in on Article 16 on the importance of the um, protection of um, privacy. So I was um, privileged to be part of the drafting group for general comment number 25, um, which is how the Committee on the Rights of the Child specifies how the convention applies in relation to all things digital. Um, and I do urge people to read the whole document. I've just here highlighted a few paragraphs about the importance of privacy um, and the Im importance of taking, um, of, of understanding and implementing children's privacy often through data protection and through privacy by design um, as part of a recognition of the wider um, array of children's rights. So um, to respect privacy must be proportionate, part of the best interests of the child, um, not undermine children's other rights, um, but ensure their protection. Um, and I really put these paragraphs up to show that we are addressing something complex um, in the uh, offline world and even more complex, uh, I fear, uh, in the digital world, um, where data protection mechanisms are often our main, but not only tool uh, to protect children's privacy um, in, in, in digital um, contexts. I'm an academic researcher, a social psychologist, and in my own work, I, I spend a lot of time with children uh, seeking to understand um, exactly how they understand their rights, their privacy. Uh, and we did an exercise as part of a, um, some research a couple of years ago that I wanted to kind of introduce the types of privacy um, and the ways in which children, as well as we, could think about privacy. So as you can see um, on the screen, uh, we did a workshop where we asked children their thoughts on sharing different kinds of information with different kinds of sources, with different um, organizations. 
um, what would they share and under what conditions with um, their school, with trusted institutions like the doctor or a future employer? What would they share with their online peers and contacts? What would they share with companies and what did they want to keep to themselves? And we use this um, as an exercise to show that children know quite a lot. They want to know even more. And they don't think of their privacy only as a matter of their personal, their interpersonal privacy. Um, but it is very important to them that the institutions and the companies um, uh, also respect their privacy. And if I can summarize what they said in one sentence, um, the idea that companies would take their data and um, exploit their privacy, the children's cry was, it's none of their business. And the irony that we are dealing with here today is that it is precisely those companies' business. We can see some similar kinds of statements from children now around the world um, in the consultation that was conducted to inform uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child at General Comment 25. And as you can see here, children around the world have um, plenty to say about their privacy and exactly understand it both as a, a fundamental right in itself and also as um, important for all their other rights. Um, privacy mediates safety, privacy mediates dignity, pri privacy mediates um, the right to information and so forth, many more. I think we're now in the terrain of looking for um, uh, regulatory strategies as well as educational ones uh, and I was asked to mention I think this panel will discuss the idea of age-appropriate design codes um, particularly as one um, really uh, proving valuable mechanism uh, and we will talk further about this um, I know but the idea that um, children's privacy should be respected and protected in a way that is appropriate to their age and that understands the link between privacy and children's other rights. I think this is really important. And we see um, this, this, this um, regulatory move now happening in a number of different um, international and national contexts. I've spent the last few years working with the Five Rights Foundation as part of the digital running the Digital Futures Commission. And I just wanted to kind of come back to that holistic point here. Um, in the Digital Futures Commission, we ask children to comment and discuss all of their rights in digital contexts, and um, not just as a research project, but as an, um, a consultation activity to really understand what children um, think and want to happen and what um, to, to be heard on a matter that affects them. And privacy online is absolutely a matter that affects them. Um, and we use this to come up with the a proposal for child rights by design, which builds on initiatives for privacy by design, safety by design, security by design, but goes beyond to recognize the holistic um, nature of children's rights. And so here we really pulled out 11 principles um, based on uh, all the articles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and on General Comment 25. Um, and so you can see that privacy is a, is a right to be protected in the design of digital products and services as part of attention to children's, um, the age appropriate service and um, building on consultation, supporting children's best interests, promoting their safety, well-being, development and agency. And I will stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Livingstone. That was very, very insightful. We will now move to Edmund. Uh, would you like to take the floor? Hello. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for having me. And um, Edmund from Dot Asia. Um, we'll be sharing, uh, I guess, 
building on what uh, Sonia just mentioned, uh, um, we'll be sharing a little bit about our work at Dot Kids, um, which uh, actually also uh, kind of uh, trying to operationalize uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. But um, first of all, I just want to give a quick um, uh, background why Dot Asia is involved in this. Um, Dot Asia ourselves is a um, ov obviously operates the Dot Asia top level domain, so you can have domains such as uh, whatever Dot Asia. That um, provides the, the the income source for us, and um, so every Dot Asia domain actually contributes to the internet development in Asia. One of the things, you know, some of the things that we do uh, include youth um, engagement, and um, we actually are very proudly uh, that very proud that the Net Mission uh, program is the uh, longest-standing uh, youth internet governance uh, engagement program, and that sort of built uh, uh, our. Um, um, interests or, or our uh, awareness to, to supporting uh, children's uh, and children's rights online. Um, back in 2016, we actually launched a little program that, that looked at um, the uh, uh, impact of uh, um, uh, sustainable development goals and uh, the, the internet. Uh, and we recently launched a, an eco-internet uh, initiative, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, what I want to highlight is that um, engaging uh, children on platforms, including uh, domain, top-level domains, uh, is something that, that I think is, is important and one of the things that uh, I would like to share. So. On the specific topic of Dot Kids, um, actually, the Dot Kids initiative started um, uh, more than a decade ago in 2012 when the application to, uh, for Dot Kids was put in uh, uh, for, to, to I, through ICANN for the Dot Kids top level domain. Right at that point, actually, there was a uh, engagement with the the children's rights and children's welfare uh, community uh, about the process itself. But I won't go into details. What I did want to highlight is that um, part of the vision of Dot Kids is actually to engage children to be part of the process in de developing policies that affect them, uh, and to to involve children's participation and so on. And in fact, in 2013, during the process where we were going through the ICANN process, um, we actually helped support one of the, well, the first uh, children's forum uh, that is focused on the ICANN uh, uh, process itself, um, and that was held in April of 2013. Fast forward to 10 years, um, we were finally um, able to uh, uh, put dot kids into place um, in uh, late, uh, well, actually last year, but uh, the, uh, the, the dot kids top level domain actually entered the internet um, in, on April 4th of 2022 and was launched um, at, at late last year in November 29th um, of 2022. So it is um, less than a year old, so um, th really not even a toddler uh, for, for dot kids. But let's focus on the difference, I mean, um, that between dot kids and, for example, dot Asia or, or, or dot com, right? I mean, uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, at the ICANN level, there is no difference. For, for ICANN, you know, uh, operating a dot kids would be exactly the same as operating dot com. We did disagreed, and that's why we engaged into the, the decade-long uh, um, kind of uh, uh, campaign to, to, to operate dot .kids, and believe that there are policies that are required um, above and beyond just a regular registry, just a regular .com or dot .wherever, because there is not only a set of expectations, there are, um, it is important for, um, and here is why we say it's the kids' best interest domain. That is the idea behind dot .kids, and let's look at part of the registry policies. Um, but it, for dot .kids ourselves, if you, um, you, know, you think about it, of course, we don't keep uh, children's data or, or, or data about kids, um, but does that mean we don't have to have policies that, that actually is around the registry uh, or for dot .kids domains itself? Well, we think no, and um, 
building off what uh, 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 Professor Livingstone was saying, um, in fact, we have a set of guiding principles that was developed with the support from the uh, children's rights and welfare community and based on the Convention of the Rights of Child. And of course, there's additional uh, kids-friendly uh, guidelines, there's kids' uh, anti-abuse policy, and also kids' uh, personal data protection uh, policies. And I want to highlight that um, the, the entire guiding principles is actually based on the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, and uh, probably not all the um, uh, articles, but uh, of certainly uh, uh, articles that, that, that uh, outlines um, protection and prohibited materials. A, a kind of way to think about it is probably that um, for the dot kids domain, we do um, enforce and to 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 ensure that restricted content. And the best way to think about it is really that if you if if you think of a movie, uh, the restricted content uh, or the res uh, uh, rated R uh, movies would obviously not be uh, uh, acceptable on dot kids domains. Um, but on top of that, we, we also have specific um, privacy uh, um, um, pr uh, provisions um, also built on Article 16, as uh, Sonia mentioned earlier, um, and some other um, aspects that, that is around the um, uh, conventions of the right of child. Um, so we think um, that is it's, there's something that that is important and and is being built into it and we're probably uh, we're definitely the first um, registry that uh, is is built policies around the convention on the rights of the child but we are also one of the very few uh, domain registries that would actually actively um, uh, engage in suspension of domains uh, or, or processes to uh, to 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 deal with uh, restricted content uh, Beyond that, there's a portal and, and a platform to to uh, report abuse um, and to alert us on on issues. And in fact, I can report that we have already taken um, taken action on on uh, abusive content and and restricted content and so on. But um, I will like to end with a few items. Um, there are certainly a lot of abuses um, on the internet, but th the abuses that is appropriate for top-level domain registries to actually take is a subset of that. Um, there are many other uh, uh, abuses that happen on the on the internet, and um, you know there there are different types of DNS abuses and different types of cyber abuses that may or may not be. Um, uh, effective for the registry to take care of, and that's, I guess, part of what we discuss. So that's why we bring it to this, uh, to to IGF and these type of forums to discuss, is because um, there are other stakeholders that needs to be uh, the, to 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 help support a, a a safer environment online for for children. So with that, I, I guess um, there are a number of uh, um, acts that are, uh, that are put in place uh, in the recent years, and I think DotKids will try to, um, is a good platform to support the uh, Kids Safety Online Bill in, in the US and on the Online Safety Bill in the UK. Uh, we do believe that collaboration is required in terms of security and privacy, and one of the vision, as I mentioned, for, for dot kids is to engage children uh, in the process, and we hope that we will reach there soon, um, but, you know, it's still in its toddler phase, so it doesn't generate inco enough income to for us to, to bring everyone here, but the vision itself um, is to put the policies and protection in place and also into the future be able to support children's participation in this um, uh, internet governance discussion that we have. Okay, thank you so much, Edmund. That was very, very inspiring. Um, let's now go to Njmile. Thank you, Ananya. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for joining the session, um, giving me the opportunity to speak about USAID's work in this area. Um, so USAID is an independent agency of the United States government uh, where I work with 9,000 colleagues in 100 countries around the world to provide humanitarian relief and to fund international development. In the technology division where I sit, there are a number of initiatives that we support related to digital innovation from securing last mile internet con connectivity 
to catalyzing national models of citizen-facing digital government. And we work in close collaboration with our U.S. government colleagues in Washington to inform and provide technical assistance to support locally-led partnerships and to create the project ideas and infrastructure needed to sustain the responsible use of digital tools. Although we rely consistently on researching, developing, and sharing best practices, our activity design can be as varied as the specific country and community contexts in which we are called to action. Indeed, the many interconnected challenges that come with supporting the development of digital societies has challenged our own evolution as an agency. So in early 2020, we launched USAID's first digital strategy to articulate our internal commitment to technological innovation, uh, as well as for the support of open, inclusive, and secure digital ecosystems in the countries we serve through the responsible use of digital technology. And so that digital strategy is a five-year plan that is implemented through a number of initiatives, and there are some that are particularly relevant to our work with young people. Specifically, we have made commitments to improve digital literacy, uh, to promote data literacy through better awareness, advocacy, and training for data privacy, protection, and national strategies for data governance, to improve cybersecurity, to close the gender digital divide and address the disproportionate harm women and girls face online, and to protect children and youth from digital harm. Each of these initiatives is supported by a team of dedicated professionals that allow us to think about how we work at the intersection of children and technology. Digital tools play an increasingly important role for adults working to protect children, for example, by facilitating birth registration, providing rapid family tracing, supporting case management, and by using better, faster analysis of the data collected to inform the effectiveness of these services. And they can also play a role in the development and integration of children themselves into larger social and cultural norms by providing a place to learn, play, share, explore, and test new ideas. Indeed, many children are learning how to use a digital, a digital device before they even learn how to walk. However, we also know that increased digital access also means increased risk. And so in the context of protecting children and youth from digital harm, USAID defines digital harm as any activity or behavior that takes place in the digital ecosystem and causes pain, trauma, damage, exploitation, or abuse, directly or indirectly, in either the digital or physical world, whether financial, physical, emotional, psychological, or sexual. For the estimated one in three internet users who are children, these include risks that have migrated onto or off of digital platforms that enable bullying, harassment, technology-facilitated gender-based violence, hate speech, sexual abuse and exploitation, recruitment into trafficking, and radicalization to violence. Because digital platforms also generate and share copious amounts of data, our colleagues um, who've done a, an incredible amount of highly commendable work um, at UNICEF, for example, around children's data, as well as my colleagues on today's panel will likely agree that there are other perhaps less obvious risks. For example, we've observed observed in recent years that children seem to have given up or into or in, I should say, to uniform consent of their data collection, um, probably due to their naivete and trust of uh, the platforms in which they're engaging. But a lack of informed decision making about data privacy and protection effectively transfers power from the data subject to the data collector, and the consequences of this can be long lasting. The number of social media likes, views, and shares are based on highly interactive levels of data sharing, affecting children's emotional and mental health. Data algorithms can be leveraged to profile and manipulate children's behavior, narrowing exposure to new ideas, limiting perspective, and even stunting critical thinking skills. Data leaks and privacy breaches that are not just harmful on their own, but can be orchestrated to cause intentional damage. Um, is another risk. 
And we can counteract these and other challenges by helping practitioners understand the risk to children's data and to ensure accountability for bad actors. The theoretical physicist Albert Einstein is famously quoted as saying that if he had one hour to solve a problem, he would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and only five minutes on the solution. And the sheer amount of data that we generate and have access to means that our vision of solving the global challenges we face with data is still very much possible, especially as we are realizing unprecedented speeds of data processing that are fueling innovations in generative AI, will enable the use of 5G, and that we will see in quantum computing. So as we celebrate the 50th birthday of the internet at this year's IGF, it's amazing to think about how much all of us here have been changed by the technological innovations paved by the internet. And in that same spirit of innovation, we're optimistic at USA that data governance frameworks can help mitigate the risks we see today and be leveraged to create a safer, more inclusive, and even more exciting world of tomorrow, which is the internet our children want. Thank you very much, and Jamile. Um, Emma, would you like to take the floor next? Emma, are you here with us? Thank you, yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay, so I've been asked to answer how civil society organizations can tackle the topic of child-centered data protection. Um, I think this is a multi-stakeholder issue and there are many things civil society organizations can do. As a lawyer, I'm going to have a focus on the more um, law and policy focused ideas. So there are three main approaches that I have identified. The first is civil society organizations can engage in advocacy related to law and policy. Second, they can engage themselves um, in litigation and request to regulators, I should say. And third, they can carry out community-based human rights impact assessments themselves. So the first example of advocacy related to law and policy, here the target is policymakers and regulators. As an example of this, um, I was involved in a project that was led by Professor Sonia Livingstone, who's also on this panel. And this was part of the UK Digital Futures Commission. Um, and it was a project which involved a team of social scientists and lawyers. And we looked in detail at how the use of ed tech in schools is governed in the UK. And we found it's not very clear whether the use of ed tech in schools was covered by the UK Age Appropriate Design Code or Children's Code. So the situation of data protection for children in the education context was very uncertain. We had a couple of meetings with the ICO and the Digital Futures Commission also had a group of high level commissioners they had brought together from government, civil society, the education sector and the private sector. And they held two public meetings about the use of ed tech in UK schools. Subsequently, in May 2023, the ICO published updated guidance on how the Children's Code applies to the use of EdTech in UK schools. I won't go into the details of that guidance now, but suffice to say this was much needed clarification, and it seemed to be as a result of our advocacy, although this was not specifically stated. The second example is of civil society organizations engaging themselves in litigation and requests to regulators. So some civil society organizations have lawyers as part of their staff, or they can work with lawyers um, and other experts. So an example of this is um, an organization in the US called Fair Play. In 2018, they led a coalition asking the Federal Trade Commission to investigate YouTube for violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, by collecting personal information from children on the platform without parental consent. And as a result of their complaint, um, Google and YouTube were required to pay what was then a record $170 million fine in a settlement in 2019 with the Federal Trade Commission. So in response, rather than getting required parental permission before collecting personal information from children on YouTube, 
Google claimed instead it would comply with COPPA by limiting data collection and eliminating personalised advertising on their Made for Kids platform. So Fairplay wanted to check if YouTube had really eliminated personal advertising on their Made for Kids products, and they ran their own test by buying some personalised ads. Fairplay says that their test proves that ads on Made for Kids videos are in fact still personalised and not contextual, which is not supposed to be possible under COPPER. And Fairplay wrote to the Federal Trade Commission in August 2023 and made a complaint and asked them to investigate and to impose a fine of upwards of tens of billions of dollars. We don't know the outcome of this yet. That complaint was only put in in August this year. And then the third solution, which I think is a, is a really good one for civil society organisations, which I haven't really seen done completely in practice yet, is to carry out community-based human rights impact assessments. So often companies themselves carry out human rights impact assessments, but it's also absolutely something that can be done at a community level. And this involves um, considering not just data protection, but also children's broader human rights as well. It's a multidisciplinary effort, so it involves consulting with the company about the impact of their, of their products and services on children's rights, perhaps working with technical experts to test what's actually happening with children's data through apps and platforms, and working with legal experts to assess whether this complies with laws and regulations. And crucially, this should also involve meaningful consultation with children, and I think we're going to talk a little bit later about what meaningful consultation with children really looks like. I'm going to leave it there because I think I'm probably at the end of my time, but looking forward to discussing further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And finally, Theodora, would you like to let us know what your opening remarks are? Yes, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, let me just pull up my slides. Alrighty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hang on, hold on one second. Let me just grab. Okay. Great. So Alrighty, so it's great to be here with all of you. And uh, I'll be spending a few minutes talking about key international uh, children's rights principles, standards and conventions, as well as major issue areas around personal data collection, processing and profiling, and then some regulation and legislation to be keeping an eye out for. So I'll start with standards and conventions and then turn to some principles. So some of the major relevant standards and conventions that um, are worth discussing I've listed here, which include the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, a widely ratified international human rights treaty, which enshrines the fundamental rights of all children under age 18. Um, it includes a number of provisions that are relevant to children's data protection, such as the right to privacy, the right to the best interests of the child, and the right to freedom of expression. Um, also, the UN guidelines for the rights of the child as it relates to the digital environment in 2021. Um, these guidelines provide guidance around how to apply the UN CRC, or the rights of the child, to children's rights in the digital environment. Um, and they include a number of provisions that are relevant to children's data protection, like the right to privacy and confidentiality, the right to be informed about the collection and use of data, and the right to have data erased. Um, then there's GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. So this is a comprehensive data protection law that applies to all organizations that process data for those in uh, Europe, although sometimes this has been extended beyond specifically for companies that or employers that are um, international and exist beyond the European area. And these include a number of special provisions for children as well. And then COPA, um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act in the US is a federal law that protects the privacy of children under age 13 and requires websites and online services to obtain parental consent before collecting or using children's personal information. So some of the principles that um, are important to discuss here include data collection, 
data use, data storage and security, data access, data and erasure, transparency and accountability. Um, so this means that organizations should only collect data for legitimate purposes and with the consent of parents and guardians. On data use, it's that organizations should use children's data in a way that is consistent with their best interest. On data storage and security, organizations should implement appropriate security measures to protect children. On data access and erasure, organizations should give children and their parents or guardians access to children's data and the right to have it erased. On transparency and accountability, organizations should be transparent about what they're doing um, to make sure that they're protecting children. Additionally, there's age appropriate design, privacy by default, data minimization, and parental controls. So um, products and services should be designed with the best interests of children in mind and also be appropriate for their age and developmental stage. On privacy by default, um, products and services, <coughs> excuse me, should be developed with privacy in mind. On data minimization, products and services should only collect and use the minimum amount of data required. And on parental controls, products and services should um, provide parents with meaningful control um, over their children's online activities. Um, so major issues around personal data collection, processing, and profiling that um, are in discussion today include consent. So children may not fully understand what it means to consent to the collection and use of their personal data. Um, that's also true for adults, but it's especially true for children. Um, transparency. So organizations may not be transparent about how they collect, use, and share uh, children's personal data, which can be make which can make it difficult for parents to make informed decisions about their children. Data minimization. So organizations often collect more personal data than is necessary for the specific purpose, um, and this excess data can have other purposes like targeted ads, profiling. On data security, organizations may not be implementing adequate security measures to protect the personal data of children from unauthorized access, disclosure modification, and destruction, which can put children at risk. And profiling, uh, organizations may use children's personal data to create profiles, um, which can be used to target children um, with advertising and, uh, and content um, that might not be in their best interests. Additionally, um, strengthening legal protection. So there's an ongoing conversation around how governments can strengthen legal protections for children, um, such as pr requiring parental consent and prohibiting organizations from, from profiling children through targeted advertising. Also raising awareness. There is a huge conversation ongoing now about how parents and children should be educated about the risks and benefits of sharing personal data online to make sure they're making informed decisions about what to share and what not to share. Uh, also improve transparency and accountability. Organizations should be transparent about how they collect, use, and share children's personal data, and they should be accountable for that data. Uh, and then last is designing privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, technologists can design products and services that collect and use less personal data from children, um, and also that help children and parents manage their privacy online. So next, we'll look at regulation and legislation. We've been seeing a huge amount of regulation and legislation in this space. Um, in the US context, we've seen some US federal bills, um, but because those haven't passed, we've been seeing a transition to um, state level bills. So I wanna pull up, there we go. So um, this is a piece that I wanted to share that talks about bills in the area. Um, that we're seeing in the US. So there is here a compilation of 147 bills across um, the US states, not all represented, but a lot of them are. And interestingly, states across the political divide. Um, and you can see here, um, the legislation that's in discussion includes themes like age verification, um, more age ver verification, instruction, um, parental consent, data privacy, technologies, um, access issues, more age verification, so that's a clearly a recurring theme, um, uh, recommendations on the basis of data, et cetera. And you can see here, there are some categories. So we see law enforcement, parental consent, age verification, um, privacy, school-based, hardware, filtering, perpetrator, so that looks at that safety, algorithmic regulation, um, and more. 
And then we can see the methods. So these include um, third parties, state digital IDs, commercial provider, um, government IDs, self-attestation. Um, and then you can see what ages these are targeting. So mostly they're targeting age 18, but there are a few that look at 13 um, and sometimes other ages as well. And then the final categories of analysis look at um, uh, access limited content or services, enforcement types and status. Um, and I think that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Theora. Um, I do receive, um, I have received a request actually from the audience. If you could kindly share the link to the website that you were just sharing with us, that would be great. It was uh, a very, very, very good remark. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will now be moving on to the next segment where I will be directing questions to each of our speakers. We will begin with Professor Sonia Livingstone. While I had a set of questions prepared for you, Professor Livingstone, I think you kind of answered most of those. So let's pick something from what you have focused on in your opening remarks. You mentioned about age-appropriate design code. So I wanted to know, what are your views on um, this age-appropriate design code for different countries since in different cultural, national, international, and local contexts, what is appropriate for what age differs? So what would you like to uh, say about that and how can an age-appropriate design code be the answer in such varying contexts? Thank you, that's a, that's a great question and um, I think um, others will want to pitch in. I think my starting point is to say that if we're going to respect the rights of children online, we have to know which user is a child. And um, the history of the internet so far is a failed attempt to uh, respect children's rights without knowing which user is a child. So at the moment, we either have no idea who a user is or we somehow assume or producers, uh, product um, producers uh, somehow assume that the user is an adult, often um, in the global north, often male and rather um, competent to deal with what they find. So we, we, we need a mechanism and age appropriate design code has become exactly this mechanism. And I think the extent to which it's being taken up um, in the global north and the global south shows the genuine need to identify um, who is a child. There are two problems. Um, one you didn't highlight, but it does mean that we need to um, in some way identify the age of every user in order to know which ones are children because we don't know obviously who is a child before. So there is a, there is a real set of questions around the mechanism um, and uh, which others have alluded to. And then, as you rightly say, what is appropriate for children of different ages varies in different cultures. I think I would um, answer that by um, returning to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It addresses the child rights at the level of the universal, the right to privacy, the right to safety, the right to information, the right to um, 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 civil rights and liberties to participate, to be heard and so forth. So we can um, conceive of children's rights at the universal level, um, but there are also many provisions in the convention and also in general comment 25 about how this can be and should be um, adjusted and tailored to particular circumstances, not to qualify or undermine children's rights, um, but to use mechanisms um, that are appropriate to, to different cultures. And I think this will always be um, contested uh, and probably should be, um, but it, at heart, the, the, if you read the age appropriate design codes, they focus on the way, ways in which data itself is used by companies um, in order to um, uh, support children's rights, rather than setting a norm for what children's lives should look like. Thank you very much, Professor Livingstone. Um, that was a very, very detailed and very nuanced answer. Uh, next, Edmund, since we are on the subject of age, what do you think is a good age verification mechanism which does not in itself lead to the collection of more personal data? 
Of course, that is a very difficult question. Uh, but um, I guess a few principles to start with. Um, first of all, privacy is not about keeping data secure and confidential. Privacy, the first question is whether the data should be collected and kept in the first place. So uh, in terms of privacy, if, you, if it is just an age verification and whoever verifies it discards or erases or deletes the data after the verification, there should be no privacy concern. But of course, platforms and providers don't usually do that, and that's one of the problems, right? Um, but, but the principle itself should be, you know, just like when, when you w show your ID or whatever, um, the person takes a look at it, you know, you, you go, th go, <laughs> go in and, you know, that's, that's it. They, they don't take a picture of it and keep a record of it. So that's privacy to start with. The other thing then, then we need to probably think about whether the age verification is to keep children out or let children in, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's a big difference, you know, uh, in terms of how you would then deal with it. But um, especially on, on whether or not data, you know, should be, should be uh, kept or should be discarded. Now on the, the, the actual verification mechanism, I think, um, uh, in fact, there is well-developed uh, uh, systems now to do what is called pseudon pseudonym pseudonymous uh, credentials. Um, so basically, you don't, the, the platform or the provider doesn't have to know the exact data, but um, can establish digital credentials with uh, digital certificates and cryptographic technologies, uh, techniques such that parents can vouch for the age and, and complete the verification without disclosing um, the child's personal data. I think these are the mechanisms that are appropriate. Um, and more importantly, I guess I go back to the, the main thing is that if it is just for age verification, whatever data that was used should be discarded the moment the, the verification is done. And that is the, the, you know, that gives you real privacy. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Next, Njimili. How is the USAID thinking about data governance, especially with uh, relation to children's data governance? Yeah. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about data governance, uh, and that's because <clears throat> data really fuels the technology that we use. It either um, generates data in some way or uses data for its purpose. Um, and technologies have a tendency to reinforce in ex existing conditions. Um, and so we want to be really intentional about how data is used um, to that end. Data governance is important for a few basic reasons. Uh, one is because data by itself is not intelligent, so it's not going to govern itself. And because data multiplies when you divide. So there is so much of it, right? We know that the sheer amount of data, again, that we're generating um, needs to be wrangled in some manner if we're going to have some control over the tools that we're using. Um, so data governance framework helps us think to think about what needs to be achieved with the data, who will make decisions about how the data is treated, and how governance of the data will be implemented. Writ large, we look at five levels of data governance implementation, and that's everything from transnational data governance down to individual protections and empowerment. Um, and that's really the sweet spot for us in thinking about children, um, it's about developing awareness and agency about participation in data ecosystems. Kind of in the middle is thinking about sectoral data governance, uh, where we find that there are highly developed norms around data privacy, data for decision making, data standardization, um, that help structure data-driven tools like digital portals for sharing data. Um, and so we are currently working with Mozilla Foundation um, on a project similar to the one that we heard Emma talking about, uh, where we are working in India and India's public education sector to think about uh, data governance interventions there. India has one of the largest, if not the largest, school systems uh, for children in the world. 
150 million children are enrolled in about one and a half million schools across the country. Um, India had one of the largest, the longest, I'm sorry, periods of shutdown during COVID-19, and EdTech stepped into that gap um, very altruistically, right, to try to close gaps in student education. However, um, as again, Emma has pointed out, and we have found in our own research, there were some nuances in the ways that these ed tech institutions were thinking about student learning uh, compared to the way schools were. Um, and so, you know, private industry is incentivized by number of users and not necessarily learning outcomes. There needed to be some clarity around the types of standards that ed tech companies um, are to meet. There is a reliance on ed tech. Um, replacing teachers' interaction with students and data subjects generally lacking awareness about how their data is used by ed tech and schools to measure student progress um, and learning. So we're currently working with a number of working groups in India to really understand how to bridge this gap. Um, and to synchronize the collection of data and data analysis that harmonizes um, analog tools with digital tools. So teachers who are taking uh, attendance, how does that correlate to scores on ed tech platforms? And so we're you know, focused right now on the education sector, but we imagine that this is going to have implications for other sectors as well. We're also working, and I don't know if I mentioned that um, this partnership is with Mozilla Foundation. We're also working uh, in partnership with Mozilla to look at responsible and ethical computer science for university students, also in India and in Kenya. And here, uh, we're hoping to educate the next generation of software developers to think more ethically about the social impacts of the technology they create, including generative AI. And then going back to the protecting children and youth from digital harm that we're doing, we are extremely proud to be working alongside and supporting um, youth advocates through our Digital Youth Council. We have uh, Ananya, who participated in Cohort One, and Mariam, who um, was, I believe, in the room a little bit earlier, uh, helping to moderate the chat for today's session, um, who are extraordinary examples of the type of talent that we've been able to attract and to learn from. In year two of the cohort, we received almost 2,700 applications worldwide. Um, and from that number, we selected 12 council members and we're anticipating you know, just as fabulous results from them. Uh, and so that's generally how we are thinking about children's uh, data through our data governance frameworks. Um, I think just, you know, kind of riffing off of what I've heard today, we can also advocate through data governance for um, inclusion and enforcement of the rights of children into national data privacy laws, especially as we know in IGF, uh, lots of countries are thinking about how to develop those privacy laws. We should be advocating for the rights of children to be included. Um, and in civil society, there's opportunity to explore alternative approaches to data governance. Data cooperatives, which are community driven, uh, can help groups think about how to leverage their data for their own benefit. Civil society perhaps um, has room to explore the concept of data intermediaries where they are a trusted third party that works on behalf of vulnerable groups like children um, to negotiate when their data is accessed and to also enforce sanctions when data is not used in the way that it was intended to. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and since uh, Njumir has already approached on the conversation on bringing in the civil society, why don't we move to Emma Day and ask her the next question. So Emma, how do you think civil society organizations um, could work with children to promote better data protection for children? 
Thanks so much for the question. And um, yeah, I think Jamila came up with some really good uh, good starting points for this conversation already. I think for to involve children, it has to really be meaningful. And one of the difficulties, not just with children, in fact, with consulting with communities in general on, on these topics of data governance is it's very complex and it's hard for people to understand immediately um, the implications of data processing for, for their range of rights, particularly projecting into the future and what those future impacts might be. So I think to begin with, to make that consultation meaningful, you have to do a certain amount of education. And I think some of the great ways to do this are to involve children in things like data subject access requests, where they can be involved in the process of, of writing to a company and, and requesting the data that that company is keeping on them so they can see in practice what's happening with their data and, and form a view on what they think about that. Um, and for children to be involved in, in these kinds of um, community data um, auditing processes or uh, so there is some auditing of AI community-based processes that have been going on, which I don't think have involved children so far, but obviously older children could get involved in these kinds of initiatives. And I think um, involving children in conceptualizing how data intermediaries can work best for children of different ages is really important. This is something we talked about um, a couple of years ago now, I, I was one of the authors of the UNICEF Manifesto on Data Governance for Children. Um, and we had a few ideas in there about what civil society organizations can do to involve children. I haven't seen a lot of this happen in practice. Um, another one of the key things that, that I would like to see is for civil society organizations to involve children in, in holding companies accountable by auditing their products, by doing these kinds of community-based human rights impact assessments. Um, and I think we need to think about not just the platforms and the apps, but also some of the things like um, age verification tools, like ed tech products, like health tech products, tools that are used in the criminal justice system, that are used in the social welfare system. You really almost, technology products impact almost all areas of children's lives. And we have to remember that all of these are, are private sector companies, even where they're providing solutions that are that are essentially to promote children's rights. We need to ensure that children are involved in, in auditing those products and making sure that they really are having benefit for, for children's rights. But I think to do that, civil society organizations need to ensure that they involve academics, they involve technologists, and they involve legal experts to make sure that they, they really get it right, because these are complex assessments to make. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to Theodora. I know you mentioned about a lot of the existing international standards, conventions, and laws regarding children's rights and their data. What about the regulations and legislations which are underway to address some of these concerns? Are there any particular um, areas where these regulations could do better or any other suggestions that you might have for any such future conventions? Hi, everyone. That's a really great question. Thanks, Ananya. So I'm going to screen share again just so folks can see the um, database that I was referencing earlier. Um, I think, to me, it's not so much that there are specific technical gaps in what we're seeing, but rather, um, and, and of course, this is a US focused conversation. Um, and it's important to mention that there is legislation being discussed globally, outside of the US as well. Um, and that legislation that's happening elsewhere um, is inclusive of children's safety issues. Um, so for example, in the European Union, um, transparency related measures like the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act will have impacts on child safety and the new UK online safety bill, um, which is underway, um, will also impact child safety and, and legislation discussions are happening elsewhere as well. But within the US where this data set was collected and where my knowledge is strongest, um, I think that it is pretty comprehensive. Although it's, it's interesting to note that one of the questions that I saw in the chat um, touched on a theme that wasn't discussed here in this legislation. So specifically, um, the question was whether there was, um, 
and I'm just looking through the chat again, uh, whether there was, here we go. Um, oh yeah, laws relate or legislation related to assistive ed tech in schools. So um, I observed here that there are four school-based policies and two hardware-based policies, um, but none of them are focused on uh, assistive ed tech. Um, the ones that are focused on schools look more at um, like access, age verification, policies, and education. And the hardware ones are focused more on filtering and technical access, um, or rather, um, so you can see those here, like requiring tablets and, and smartphone manufacturers to have filters that are, are enabled at activation and only um, bypassed or switched off with a password. Um, so you can see that there is a quite a range. Um, I think to me, the bigger concern is um, whether this legislation will pass. Um, we see a really divided political landscape. And even though we're seeing a proliferation of um, data and data-related issues around children um, in legislative spaces, the concern is that there isn't going to be a legislative majority um, for this legislation to pass. So it's not per se that I see specific gaps um, and more that I have broader concerns about the viability of legislation and the quality of the legislation because not all of it is, is equally as high quality. Um, and so I think the the increasing fraught political landscape that we find ourselves in uh, is making it harder to pass good legislation and and there are competing interests at play as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to thank all our speakers for sharing their insights with our attendees. And at the very same time, I would like to thank our attendees who I see are having a very lively chat in Zoom. Um, hence, since you have so many questions, why don't we open the floor for questions from the audience? We would be taking questions from both on-site and online uh, audience. If you're on-site and if you have a question, um, you have two stand mics right there. You could kindly go to the microphones and please ask your question by stating your name and the country you're from. And post that, we will be taking questions from the chat. May I start? Okay, thank you. My name is Jutta Kroll. I'm from the German Digital Opportunities Foundation. They're heading a project on children's rights in the digital environment. First of all, let me state that I couldn't agree more with what Sonia said in her last statement that if we don't know the age of all users, age verification wouldn't make sense. We need to know whether people are over a certain age, belong to a certain age group or under a certain age. And my question would be, uh, we need to adhere to the principle of data minimization. So whether any of you has already a thought how we can achieve that without creating a huge amount of additional data and even the Digital Services Act doesn't allow to collect additional data, uh, data just to us, um, to verify the age of a user. So it's, it's quite a difficult task. And Ed One has already said, if we could trust companies when they do the age verification that they delete afterwards the data, but I'm not sure whether we can do so. So uh, that would be my, my question. And uh, the second point would also go to the last speaker, Theodora that when you, when you gave us a good overview on, on the legislation, um, uh, the question would be how could we ensure that legislation that is underway takes into account from the beginning the rights of children, not like it was done in the GDPR on the very last minute, <laughs> putting a reference to, to children's rights into the legislation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't we leave with the first uh, half of the question? Uh, would any of these speakers like to take that? And we would then direct the second question to Fedora. Yes, please go ahead. I'm happy to add to what I already said. I guess um, uh, 
in in terms of uh, in those cases, um, then it's a pseudonymized data, right? I mean, um, so instead of collecting the actual data, there is a there. It, it is very possible for uh, uh, system like. Uh, platforms to implement pseudonymized uh, credential systems. And those um, vouching for uh, a, a, a participant's um, uh, uh, age could be distributed, right? I mean, could be schools, could be parents, could be um, uh, your workplace or whatever. Um, but as long as it is not, it is a trusted, uh, data store that does the verification uh, and then keeps a pseudonymized uh, credential, then the platform should trust that pseudonymized uh, uh, credential. So um, I think that is uh, the, the right way to go about it. The other part, I, I as much as <laughs> I still think it is the right way to, to, to ask for it to be deleted, can we trust companies? Probably not, but of course we can have uh, regulation and audits and those kind of things. But for trusted um, anchors themselves also, whether it's a school or whether it's, um, you know, uh, whatever trusted anchor that the person actually gives the age verification to, um, that institution should also delete the, the raw data and just keep the, the, the verification record, you know, verified or not verified. And that's, you know, that's the right way to do, do privacy in my mind. Thank you. I, I think Professor I Livingstone wants to add something. Please go ahead. If I may, yes. Um, actually, Edmund just um, said much of what I wanted to say, so um, I completely agree. Um, and I've been part of a European effort, EU Consent, which is al also seeking to find a, a trusted third party um, intermediary that would um, do the age check, um, hold the token, um, and not have it held by the companies. Um, so I think there are ways are being uh, found. Um, clearly, the um, uh, the context of transparency and accountability and kind of third party oversight that scrutinizes those um, uh, solutions will really need to be strong. And that also must be uh, trusted. I'd, I'd, I'd add, I think we should start this process um, with a risk assessment because not all um, sites need age checks, not all content is um, age inappropriate for children. So uh, one would like to, I, I, I would advocate that we begin with the most um, risky content and with risk assessment so we don't just roll out age verification um, excessively. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end by noting um, big tech already age assesses us in various ways. I think the big companies already know um, the age of their users um, to a greater or lesser um, degree of accuracy. And we have no um, oversight and transparency over that. So I think F the efforts being made are trying to write what is already happening and already happening uh, poorly from the point of view of um, public oversight and, and children's rights. Thank you. Uh, Emma? Yeah, thank you. I think this is a, still a question that everyone's grappling with, really. And there are differing views, maybe in different jurisdictions, around um, how well age verification products comply with, with privacy laws in different countries. Um, I, I would really agree with what Sonia said about starting with a risk assessment. I think we need to look at first what, what is the problem we're trying to solve, and then is age verification the best solution? Because to start with, if we're going to process children's data, it should be necessary and proportionate. And so we have to look at what other solutions there are that are not technical first, that might address the problem we're trying to address first, rather than looking at just age verification across, across everything. I think also there's an issue within, certainly under EU law, pseudo-anonymization pseudo is very difficult to say, but it's also, pseudo-anonymized data is still personal data under the GDPR. So it's not that straightforward within the EU to, to just use pseudo-anonymized data as, as an alternative. So I think it's still very tricky and at European Union level, this is not something that has been settled yet either. Okay, uh, and Theodora, any remarks from you? Sure. Yeah, I think this is a really great question. It's um, not easy to ensure that legislation takes into account the stated rights of children. Um, I would start with education. I think 
frankly, from my experience interacting with legislators since I participate in the advocacy process, I found that most legislators are just under-informed. And so making sure that they understand what these rights and, and principles and standards actually are, what does it mean for the right to privacy um, to be manifest in legislation or like what are the best interests of a child? What is the right to freedom of expression? What do we think about the right to be informed when it comes to children? I think most legislators just don't really know what those things mean. Um, and so educating them um, in, in particular, building coalitions of civil society actors um, and multi-stakeholder actors can be very effective in, in educating and influencing legislators around uh, the rights of children. And then as was also mentioned in the chat, I think Omar just put it in a few minutes ago, um, I believe including young people in decision-making processes is not just essential, it's empowering. Um, I think that's an important part of the process too. Um, bringing together uh, legislators, so the people who are actually writing legislation and the children themselves is really important so that um, the legislation process can be child-centric um, and really center the voices and experiences of the children that we're trying to serve. Um, and then last, I think it's important to recognize that this needs to be done in an inclusive way um, and in a way that engages children from all different kinds of backgrounds um, so that um, so that all different experiences are included as legislation is happening. But but again, I think education really is at the core here. Um, legislators want to hear from us and um, are excited when we when we raise our hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now be taking questions from the online audience. May I request the online moderator to kindly read out any questions or comments that we may have received from the online audience? Hi. Um, so we have two questions from the online participants and two comments. Question one is from uh, Omar, who is a 17-year-old. He asks, how can child-led initiatives be integrated into data governance and showing that children have a voice in shaping policies that directly impact their digital lives? He is a founder and president of Project Omna, which is an upcoming AI-powered mobile app that uh, is focused on children's mental health and child rights, and he wants to increase his impact in data governance for children. Um, second question is from Paul Roberts from the UK, and he asks, when it comes to tech companies designing products and services, how common is it for them to be including child rights design in their process, and at what stage, proactive or, af or afterthought for risk minimi minimization? Comment um, comment one is also from Omar, who said that he is from Bangladesh and is one of the 88 nominees for International Children's Peace Prize 2023 for Advocacy Works. He is the founder and president of Project Omna, and he's also the youngest and only child panelist of, ev of every global digital compact session representing children globally and provided statements on every data protection and cybersecurity for children. He's he suggested answer to a guided to the guiding questions that you started the session with is that one children's perspective are dynamic and he suggests the use of interactive story based digital tools to help children grasp the importance of their digital data and rights adapting these tools to different age levels two is that um, to collaborate with tech companies in order to develop age verification methods that employ user-created avatars or characters safeguarding personal data. Children's feedback will be instrumental in refining this approach. And three, establish child-led digital consoles or advisory groups for direct input into policy decisions. These groups should meet regularly, ensuring real-time feedback from children and aligning policies with their evolving needs and digital experiences. The final comment is from Ying Chu, who says that maybe the younger generations know more about privacy protection and how to protect their data than educators or us. After all, the children were born in the internet age and they are internet kids. Many of us are internet immigration generation, so children's opinions are equally valid. Okay, that's it. If would any of these uh, speakers or panelists like to take the two questions that our online moderator just read out? 
Well, I can start. I, I can okay. start by addressing the first one and just say, Omang, you should apply to the Digital Youth Council. Um, so we are definitely intending to have a third year and would love to see your application. Um, one of the things that we try to do there is to raise the voice of youth advocates, not just to the level of international development organizations like USAID, um, but to also empower them to activate other youth networks. Um, and in those efforts, the level of awareness raising uh, helps to inspire and incentivize solutions that we have not thought of yet. There's this constant tension between um, adults who have authority to make decisions um, and children who understand what's best for them uh, but perhaps don't have the agency to do such. And we try to use this platform as a way to bridge that gap. Okay, um, are there any other comments from the panelists? And since we are uh, running short on time, I would uh, otherwise like to move to the next segment. Okay, we see Professor Livingstone has some comments. I would request you to kindly keep it short. Uh, yes, I'll be brief. I think um, everyone here is convinced of the value of uh, youth participation, um, and uh, rightly so. Um, I think the challenge is for those who haven't yet thought of it or haven't yet um, uh, embraced its value. And so my answer to Omar and also to Paul Roberts uh, would be to uh, talk more, um, um, give more emphasis to child rights impact assessments. I think many companies understand the importance of impact assessment of all kinds and a child rights impact assessment requires and embeds uh, youth participation as part of its process, along with gathering evidence and considering the full range of children's rights. But perhaps it's more um, a, a mechanism in the language of uh, companies and so one that if, if, if child rights impact assessment were embedded in their process, perhaps um, by um, requirement, uh, I think that would um, make many improvements. Thank you, Professor Livingstone. As we enter the final eight minutes of this very, very active and enlightening session, I'm very, very happy to invite our esteemed speakers to kindly share their invaluable recommendations in um, less than a minute, if possible. The question for all the panelists is, how can we involve children as active partners in the development of data protection policies to ensure greater intergenerational justice in laws, policies, strategies, and programs? Before I give the floor to our speakers, I would also like to strongly encourage the audience to seize this opportunity and share the recommendations by scanning the QR code, which is right now displayed on the screen, or by accessing the link shared in the chat box. I would now like to welcome Professor Livingstone to kindly share her recommendation once again in less than a minute. Thank you. Well, I've mentioned child rights impact assessment and perhaps that is my, my um, really uh, key recommendation. I think um, that what we see over and again in um, uh, youth, child and youth participation is that children's and young people's views are articulate, are significant, and are absolutely um, valid. The challenge really is also for us um, who are adults. Um, every time we are in a room or a meeting or a process where we see no young people are involved, we must point it out. We must call on those who are organizing the events, and that includes ourselves sometimes, um, to point out the obvious omission um, and to be ready um, to do the work to say, these are the um, optimal mechanisms and here is a way to start um, because people find it hard, but it, it really, um, youth participation is, is, is absolutely critical in this domain and is um, of course young people's right. Thank you, Edmund. I will be very brief. I think um, a children's IGF is called for, and um, that's the beginning um, of, of this uh, wider awareness. And uh, 
I think the, uh, uh, it's about building the capacity as well, right? I mean, you can't just uh, throw children into a focus group for two hours and expect them to come up with a brilliant uh, policy <laughs> decision, right? So it's a long-term thing. So it starts with uh, actually the internet governance community and, and all these things that uh, actually have children as part of a stakeholder group. And, you know, uh, that I think is probably a, a good way to go about it. And Jamile? Thank you. I um, agree with everything that I've heard. And I would add that uh, we need to do a better job discussing uh, digital and data rights in formal education institutions. Um, I think we can do a much better job of that globally so that there's a welcome, encouraging environment uh, to hear children how they would like to um, advance their digital identities um, in a digital society. They have awareness, they have tools, um, and they have opportunities to do so uh, in safe ways with mentorship and guidance. Emma? Thank you, some great suggestions so far. Um, I would like to just emphasize that children are not a homogenous group, and I think it's really important to center the most vulnerable and marginalized children. That can be within a country or it can be geographically, um, particularly considering global reach that a lot of um, apps and platforms have these days. Um, there's a particularly great scholar I would recommend uh, reading up on Afsane Rigo's work on design from the margins, where she talks about how if, if products are designed for the edge cases, for the most difficult, most risky scenarios, in the end, it's going to benefit everyone much more. I'm going to share a link to that in the chat. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Theodora. Yeah, I think that this has been reiterated a few times, but it's worth mentioning it again. Really, we need to be centering the voices of children as active participants in conversations about their well-being. Um, and so this can be done by including them in surveys, focus groups, workshops, um, various methods that are children friendly. Um, like I said, I think in the legislative process, I think that children should be empowered to advocate for themselves, um, specifically older children, but children from all different backgrounds, um, because this is their well-being at stake. Um, and I also think that when it comes to companies, I, I would personally like to see um, children represented on these advisory boards. Um, that hasn't traditionally happened. And um, I, I put a few of the advisory boards in the chat because these are these are ways to elevate the voices of children directly in conversation with the people making, making policies for the platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As we come to the end of this enlightening session, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers for their unwavering commitment to sharing their knowledge and expertise uh, and for also making our lives easier as moderators because I see you have been responding to the comments and questions in the chat box. Um, I would also like to extend my deepest appreciation to the very, very active audience for their extremely energetic engagement and thoughtful participation. Without your presence, this session would not have been as meaningful. And while we are on the subject of people who have been instrumental in making this session a success, I would like to thank my teammates, the very talented co-organizers of uh, all the four workshops that we have hosted during the UNIGF 2023, Keo from Botswana and Nelly from Georgia. I cannot thank you both for your exemplary commitment, relentless hard work, or inspiring creativity and tireless efforts. Uh, in the absence of all of which we would not have been able to create the impact we have, I want everyone here in attendance to be aware and appreciative of the countless hours, late nights, and personal sacrifices uh, this team has made to keep this ship uh, afloat. It was my good fortune indeed to have had the honor of leading this exceptional team. So thank you once again for making this happen. As we conclude this session, I urge all of us to kindly reflect on the insights we have gained and the recommendations put forth. Let us not let this be just another event or seminar, but rather a catalyst for action. It is up to each of us to take the lessons learned today and apply them in our respective fields, organizations, and communities. 
together we can create a better world for ourselves and future generations and we are right on time arigatou gozaimasu sayonara thank you